It's a brand new year. However, we are going to continue answering your cycling questions every Friday here on Ask GC Anything. And if you've just decided to get into cycling, please don't be embarrassed by your questions. We've all been in the same position at some point and they really can't be too simple for us. In fact, it's quite pretty better for us, isn't it, if they're quite simple? Yeah, the simpler the better, really. But, uh, well, to leave your, your questions, you can do so in the comments section below this video or on most social media platforms using the hashtag TalkBack. So, without further ado, we have this question from regular contributor, forward slash commenter, Michael McDermott, who asks, Hello again. I was wondering how best to use interpret the ride data from my Garmin in order to track improvements and progress. What do coaches look at? Hashtag TalkBack. Well, that is... A really good question mark because there are so many data fields to look at it can actually be a little bit confusing after your ride to know exactly what you kind of need but fortunately there is software out there such as training peaks which allows you to make that kind of process as complicated or as simple as you want yeah as you said things have got ever more complicated in terms of the amount of data fields that you can look at and analyze post ride you can look at things like average speed but that's always a bit of a red herring because it's mm. affected by so many different factors when you're out on the open road and the same to some degree goes for heart rate as well and that is why we have always recommended using a power meter if you're really serious about tracking your training improvements and it is those improvements over a period of time that you want to look at as much as trying to really analyze each individual your ride. So if you have got a power meter and your aim is to improve your sprint for example, you want to see that over time your power over shorter durations of less than 30 seconds is improving. If it's short climbs you want to improve at, maybe one to five minutes in duration, see that graph going upwards. And if you want to improve your general fitness or time trialing or climbing over mountains, it's your longer term power that you want to see improving. So anything over 30 minutes in duration. Now there are some slightly more complicated things as Matt said that you can look at like your power to heart rate relationship over time but also during rides as well. And things like normalized power which is a really great tool for analyzing rides which weren't too consistent. So interval training or sportives or races for example. And actually we've gone into quite some detail about five metrics we think you should analyze on your rides and over the course of time in training in this next video. Yeah, which you can look at here. So to give you a real world example, if you went out for one hour and held a steady 200 watts throughout, your average power and your normalized power would be 200 watts. On the other hand, if you did the first one, first 20 minutes at 100 watts, the second 20 at 200, and the third 20 at 300, your average would still be 200 watts, but your normalized power would be 240. Much more representative of the fact that you've dug quite deep in the last 20 minutes. The next question comes in from Adam Farrelly, who says, Hi GCN, I'm a 15 year old cyclist. What kind of bike should I buy, an aluminium or a carbon? Good question, Adam. And we do get asked this a lot, especially from younger riders. And as a 15 year old, especially these days, you might actually find that a lot of your contemporaries, a lot of your peers are actually riding around racing on carbon bikes. But here, here at GCN, I think collectively, we think there's, no, there's gonna be no detriment at all to starting out on an aluminium bike at that age. And actually, I think it's quite a healthy ethos to have as a youngster to actually earn your equipment as you get better yeah. and more determined to ride your bike. And as you get better on entry-level sort of equipment, you might um, get the benefits then of sponsors coming on board and helping you finance equipment and your parents as well. And I remember racing first on a second-hand frame, second-hand entry-level equipment. And once I started to get results and my, my parents could see that I had the desire to race, that's when they start to buy me middle of the range equipment, never, yeah. never top end. And you know what? There's something very satisfying about beating somebody who's got all of the top end equipment definitely. already. Matt's definitely right, earning it really is the key. And in fact, there are some very big European amateur teams where the management still insist on not giving their riders the top end group set, even though the team probably could afford to give it to them, because they think that should be reserved when you finally make it over the threshold to professional level. Now, in terms of the actual differences between carbon and aluminium, we did a test on two bikes from Trek to see what differences we could find, and that's all coming up in this next video. And you are spending a lot of your hard-earned money here, so what's the actual difference? Well, in this case, it's between about $800 to $1,000, or about £700, and that is for an identically spec bike, remember. The difference in price is due to the fact that carbon manufacture is much more labor intensive and also more expensive. Generally though, I would imagine that when you walk into your local bike shop, you'll be looking at two different bikes of similar prices. And so in that case, 
your carbon frame one is likely to have componentry at least one or two levels below that of its aluminium counterpart. So everything's going to be a little bit heavier and also you probably have a lower grade of carbon fibre than you might otherwise want. We haven't done that in this case though because we want to be able to directly compare how these two different materials ride. Thirdly, we have this other question. We don't normally do three, but as it's the new year, we're giving you a cheeky extra video. We have this question from Christian Posovec, who asks, what can I do that I could ride 160 kilometers faster? A lot of people ask that question as well. Yeah, we, we all want to, we all want to go yeah. faster, don't we? And there are a lot of things that you can look into to improve your average speed out on a ride, no matter what the distance really. First and foremost is always in getting fitter, basically, improving your power over a certain duration. But there are a whole host of other things that you can look into at the same time. Yeah, there certainly are. I think fundamentally getting more aero will see you increase your average speed for the same power. Losing a little bit of weight will certainly see you go faster and be far more efficient up uh, long drags and climbs, of course. And also, it's definitely worth working on your technical uh, yeah. stuff. So cornering and descending, all of those things will help improve your average speed. In fact, last year we made a video on this very subject, weirdly entitled, How to Improve Your Average Speed. Oh, Take a look at this. I thought we were going to do our first ride on the hidden motor one. <laughs> anyway, let's have a look. Whilst aerodynamics won't save you much on the climbs, it'll save you a huge amount on flat and downhill sections. And quite often, you won't need to change anything at all on the bike. Yeah, so research has shown that simply bending your elbows to about 90 degrees like this so that your back is nice and flat with your head slightly lower and out of the wind can give you a 14% power saving versus your more standard position upright like this. So think about your position all the time when you're out riding on the bike. And if you're not used to this position, just practice it for short periods at a time. You know what's coming next? It's the filling of this show. It's the rapid fire round. Yeah. Cheese and pickle. Should we try and do it quickly in 2017? Yeah, let's do it. Let's start off with a question from Swedish House Fever. Has any GCN presenter raced on the track? Uh, Cy Richardson, no. Tom Last, no. Me, no. Yes. Well in track league, 1988. And Hearn Hill as well. Right, next question. Daza Lu, saddlebag or bottle cage storage? This is a controversial one because people <laughs> underneath that comment quoted rule number 29, which stipulates something about no saddlebags. However, you'll see loads of pros out training with a saddlebag. It's just so convenient. Actually, I like saddlebags. I don't think they look bad at all. We're fortunate enough to have a couple of bikes, and on the bikes with two bottle cages, I have uh, my kit in a cut-off bottle and not under the saddle. And in my bikes with a single bottle cage, I've got under the saddle, so I do both. Well, because we don't ride as far as we usually do, do That's we? That's what we certainly don't So ride normally as far. I would have liked to have two bottles in at all times. Next up, we've got this question from Gregor Durkov who asks Can you tell what I can do before races to lower my stress levels? Because when the race starts, I always have to take a dump <laughs> and I can't help myself. It's been a problem for the last season. I can tell you one thing, Gregor, you, my friend, are not alone. No, I think more <laughs> you have to be question. prepared for the dump, don't you? Because it's kind Dude. of inevitable. Yeah. Pros in their buses behind the blacked out windows will be constantly going to and from the toilet they on will. their team buses before the start of a race. It basically shows that you're motivated and up yeah. for the race and actually you've probably got more to worry about if you don't need the toilet. One handed tip though, if you're going to a sportif or a race, because of the amount of people in the same position, always, always, always carry some spare toilet roll with you. Top tip. Good advice, Stevens. Uh, Nick Botfield says, why do cycling teams change name with sponsors? It's like Arsenal being called Team O2, then Fly Emirates FC. Hashtag talk back. Very good point, Nick. Cracker. And it would be nice if teams did uh, always have the same names. The problem in cycling is the funding. It comes 100% from the sponsors. No ticket sales. At the moment, no money from Revenue. TV rights either. So it means that the team is always is named after the sponsor because there's no other money there. Yeah, so the, it's normal. Yeah, the only actual infrastructure of a cycling team is almost the equipment, really, and the management a lot of the time, and they are relatively transient compared to the business model in football, for example. Last question is from... Um, Daithi Daithi Otreithi. Sorry if we've got that wrong. We probably we have. Definitely have. Another good question. Hello, what should you do if you get chased by a farmer's dog? went out for a cycle. This you got happened. chased by a dog late last year, didn't you? I did. Locally. I did locally, yeah. Um, I what used was my... your tactic? Hey, mate. Right then, I'm off to see mummy. What? Cheerio. Are you serious, what? mate? Is that... That's... Wow. It, back in the olden days, I used to get the pump off my frame, which was like this long, and obviously 
you know, fight the dog off. I don't think I ever really hurt a dog, but it's oh to threaten and shout. I can't wait for the But these days, this. with a mini pump, I mean, it's about as much use as, as, a, as a chocolate fire guard, isn't it? So it's basically shouting at the top of your voice and maybe unclipping one foot and gently kicking at the dog. <laughs> That's All right, well, <laughs> I would personally just try and up my speed and hope that I've got oh, more yeah, speed sprinting than, off. than a dog, um, you know, rather than trying to hurt the animal. It's a good, if you do know a dodgy local dog, it's a good idea if you can do some sprint training to get ride where the dog is when it starts attacking you that's when you start your interval our final question for the first ask gc anything of 2017 comes from steve lee who asks guys why is it power meters so expensive yet my home trainer has a power meter and all sorts of other stuff and only cost me 300 pounds good question well, to answer your question, Steve, there is quite a lot of technology which goes into on-the-bike power meters. Admittedly, not quite as much technology as goes into your average smartphone, but they're not produced on anywhere the same scale or volume as a smartphone, hence why they're not able to bring the price down quite as much, although they are coming down in price gradually over the years. And my guess is that your home trainer, which costs you £300, is probably guesstimating your power as opposed to giving you an accurate number through the current resistance combined with the speed at which you are riding. Now there are smart trainers which do give you a very accurate power measurement using either accelerometers or strain gauges but you are going to have to spend a bit more than £300 to get one of those. You certainly are and actually we've got a video on this very subject. How to get set up for indoor training. What equipment do you need? This is the easiest and cheapest way of riding indoors. Generally called a turbo trainer, this one is a bit of a classic. And it works by raising your back wheel off the ground and resistance is applied to the back wheel just down here by this fan and flywheel. Meaning you can go as hard as you can, as fast as you can within the comfort of your own home. Now, the faster the back wheel goes, the greater the resistance. Now, we do feel we should mention it at this point actually, a lot of people worry that they're going to be damaging the frame of their bike by using a turbo trainer, particularly a delicate carbon frame. Except that you won't, that's actually not true. We spoke to a number of manufacturers and they all said that if you set up your turbo correctly, then your bike frame is going to be fine. Thanks as ever for all of your questions. We love reading through. Please do keep them coming in the comments section below this video, of course, and using the hashtag TalkBack on social media. Now we've got some more videos coming up for you in just a few moments time, but before you go to them, please make sure that you do subscribe to our channel, The Global Cycling Network, if you haven't done so already by clicking on the globe. Then, once you have done that, please watch this next video. It is seven tips for young cyclists. And, referring back to our point about track riding, how about clicking on this video here. GCN does the Olympic Velodrome with Sir Chris Hoy. Oh yeah, we have been on the track. I know. I have raced on the track. I know, yeah. Well, kind of racing, I lost. It? And don't forget to like and share as well.